Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a new edition of our interview presentation series today with Endeavor Silver. And Dan Dixon, the CEO, is here with us. Hey, good morning to Vancouver. How are you? Very good. Thanks for having me again, Jochen. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. And I can imagine that you feel quite good because you guys just released some hours ago your feasibility study for Ter Terronera, which we were all as shareholders really waiting a long time for that. And we are now very happy that we have a, a basis for the calculation and that you guys can really start fast uh, with yeah, ordering your long-term items and also uh, to get the project finance done. And the great thing with that is that you brought us a presentation and of course, let's dive into that. And I would say the floor is yours. Well, thanks. And you're right. Uh, it has been a little bit of a long time coming. Uh, ultimately, we had the PFS that went out in July of 2020, but we've been working hard for the last 12, 16 months on getting a feasibility study done, which gives us a little bit more confidence, uh, probably even a lot more confidence when it comes to uh, the, co the project costs and the co project build costs ultimately. And uh, we've been working with a, a global engineering firm, very reputable wood here, uh, based out of, funny enough, in Coven, a little bit out of Utah, a little bit out of Denver, and a little bit out of Vancouver. So mm -hmm. um, in this world that we live in, it's it's been a different world, but uh, I know our shareholders have been waiting a long time. We've been working pretty hard at this, and so we're happy to bring it out. And as you touched on, we released it this morning. I did a webinar that's going to be available on our website for the full presentation, but thought it would be good for your viewers that we put up the presentation, I can quickly run through and uh, touch on some, some key points that are going to be important to our, our investors and for us. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, um, the Terran Air project, and we've had some changes, not a lot of changes from the, the PFS to the feasibility study, but ultimately changes. And we've seen a lot of increase in, in costs and prices, and and that's no different for Terran Air. Um, we had a hundred million dollar initial capex under the PFS for a little bit of a smaller project, a 10 year mine life, 1600 tons per day. Under the feasibility study, we're 1700 tons per day. We have a 12 year mine life, higher grade material going through that plant. So we're going to produce 3.3 million ounces of silver and almost 33,000 ounces of gold per year over that 12 years. Uh, ultimately, it comes down to the economics and using the base case, we use $20 silver. 1575 gold. We have a NAV about $175 million, IRR of 21% with a three and a half year payback. But if you use today's prices, it's significantly better and pushes NAV almost up to $300 million. But, but the, us, sorry, the IRR yeah. is after tax, right? It's always after tax. Absolutely. That's important to know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We like to pay our taxes, and I think that's good as a, a, a corporate citizen. But the biggest and most exciting thing for us, for Terranera, it's going to double our production and cut our cost profile in half. So this year, we're going to produce somewhere between six and a half, seven million ounces of silver equivalent uh, on its own using a 79 to one ratio for silver to gold. It'll produce six million ounces of silver equivalent at a cash cost of 59 cents using the base case prices. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the uh, capex for the whole project, as you said, now in, instead of 100 million, it's 174 million now, yep. uh, 175 million dollars, I think. And uh, I think you have 125 million uh, cash in the bank, uh, which was the status of the last quarter reporting, and 147 million dollars as uh, working capital. So, uh, do you still need, let's say, a large project finance, or can you do that out of the cash flow? Because, uh, as far as I read in your press release, this is like 24 months altogether the payments. Yeah, and absolutely, we're going to be able to use some of our obviously what's on our balance sheet and cash flow. Uh, but at the same time, we're looking to leverage our balance sheet. So we have about $6 million of equipment leases as long-term debt. Otherwise, we have no other debt. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we have our accounts payable. It runs about $20 million, but we're in a very strong financial position. But we want to make sure we keep that balance sheet in a position that we can be very inquisitive in the in the space. We firmly believe that silver and gold prices are going to go up with what's happening in the macro world. And... Um, if we can use some debt to put on the balance sheet to help build Terranera, so somewhere from 80 to $100 million, we think that's going to be better for our shareholders and then free up capital for other things that might come along. Mm -hmm. Super. This slide that I kind of went to is our base case, and it's the important stuff I touched on. But as I say, from a spot price standpoint, it's a very, very attractive 
uh, project. So using $24 silver, $1,800 gold, again, you're approaching $300 million in NAV, IRR is 30%. Our cash costs are actually negative. So all the gold, the 33,000 ounces of gold pays for the three, the 3 million ounces of silver production a year. Uh, life of mine, all in sustaining costs, you're looking at a dollar per ounce of silver mm -hmm. over the life. Why is, why is it M-A-S-C? Because we say mine site all in sustaining costs. So typically all in sustaining costs includes G&A out of our Vancouver office. Uh, in this case, when we're looking at the project on our own, we don't include that G&A in that all in sustaining cost. So again, it's positive because ultimately that G&A cost that we're incurring right now for Guanas to be in Bolognitos, Will now get spread into Terranera when it comes on stream. Mm -hmm. uh, five and a half million or 5.9 million ounces silver equivalent to year again six. But the other side that's very exciting, and I have a slide later on, is the expiration upside. The Terranera vein and the Loose vein are both open along strike and to depth. And we ad identified a number of regional targets uh, that we released almost two months ago on surrounding areas, south, southeast to Terranera, and a new concession we picked up last year called Las Cuates. So again, very exciting, lots of potential. Quick uh, highlights on our feasibility study. We have a new mine plan, a longer mine life, higher production. The plant equipment, we've got quotes. It's a larger plant, 1,700 tons per day, but we've got quotes in the last six months because we have seen increase in costs over the last year, year and a half. Obviously, we've seen supply uh, constraints across the world, uh, COVID issues with regards to start and stop everywhere. Um, so we have got hard quotes on packed equipment. Those increase about 25% from our PFS, and we have contingencies built into that. So we hopefully can build uh, this mine for what we're saying we can build it through the, fee the, the FS, the feasibility study. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think our viewers, and especially your viewers, are pretty familiar with Terranera, and we've been talking about it now since 2015. But again, for those that don't know or, or don't recall, we are in the Jalisco state on the west coast of Mexico. Our other operations are in Mexico. It's an underground epithermal vein system. That's what we do at Guanasvi. That's what we do at Bolognitos. For us, Terranera is right in our wheelhouse. The difference is uh, Terranera is going to have a 12-year reserve life. We've been at Guanasvi for 15 years. We've been at Bolognitos for 12. But over that time, we actually never had more than a year to two years of reserves. Now, we've always converted because they're underground vein mines, and that's the, the geology and, and understanding that geology. But again, we have a 12-year mine life at Terranera, and, and we think we can be there 15, 20, 25 years with what's there around it. Mm -hmm. Quickly, I'll just get to this slide on our economics and the evolution. We've been doing studies, uh, as I say, we did a PEA, then a couple PFSs, and just the value creation we've done over the last five years. And 2021 wood spot sensitivity puts it as a project that's one of the premier silver projects in our space. There's only a handful that have come to market uh, and only a handful that have been organic discoveries. And for us, we picked it up for $3 million back in 2013. Uh, and as, a, as you've noted, been very successful with bringing this to ultimately a construction decision. Mm -hmm. Again, just the timelines. I won't bore your audience with too much of that. But uh, a slide that we're very proud of and, and goes to the, that work that we've done from an exploration standpoint and an engineering standpoint. Uh, you can see the growth in our reserves and resources from this side at Terranera over the years that we've held it. So a real significant increase in, in the silver grade initially, increase in tons at the back end, and ultimately throughout the project's life that we've had it, our discovery and engineering cost is 46 cents, 46 cents per ounce of silver equivalent. Um, so ultimately, have a great payback if we're going to be able to uh, bring out these ounces for about $1.15 over all in sustaining costs. Very profitable uh, project for Endeavor. And again, completely changes the landscape of Endeavor Silver and who we are, what we do, and gives us a flagship asset that mm -hmm. we will, again, double our production, cut our cost profile in half. Mm -hmm. So how fast will you do then the real pro or the final production decision and then the project finance? Would that be all done by Christmas? Yeah, I, I think Christmas is actually a very doable um, timeline. Ultimately, the banks need to see this feasibility study and the detail behind that. We've been uploading that into our data room, getting them through it. 
if we can get the banks through in the next two and a half, three months, that so puts us to Christmas and have that formal construction decision from the board when that financing's in place. Of course, like any board, we don't want to use all our cash and cash flow and, and, and get constrained by what our balance sheet is. So we want to make sure we have that financing in place mm -hmm. today uh, or when we make that decision from a construction standpoint. Mm -hmm. But everything points towards an advancement to a construction decision. We actually approved uh, this week $13 million to advance Terranera from now till December 31st to make sure we're doing the earthworks so we can stay on schedule and complete it in 21 to 24 month timeline. Absolutely. And I could imagine that uh, the interest for debt is not that expensive these days. <laughs> you know, we live in a funny world. Um, obviously, interest rates are at all time lows. And quite frankly, I think we're going to stay at all time lows for a long time, which is a, the story behind why we believe silver and gold prices are only going to continue to increase in the coming years. Um, but if we can take advantage of these low interest rates, I think that's going to be beneficial to shareholders. So um, we think that's the best way to go. And ultimately, I think our shareholders will agree with that when we come out with a financing package. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Slide 14 of the presentation just shows the grade profile. Uh, year one to four is very profitable for the company. And ultimately, that improves our economics. And the La Luz vein, which is on the right side of the screen here, it's a high grade gold vein that's actually kind of sits about two kilometers away from Terranera. We're going to bring a lot of that in, which increases our gold production in the first year. The other thing to take away from this slide is actually the Terranera vein and La Luz vein, the hard cuts. You can see some of the high grade in Terranera down at the bottom. That's our envelope for indicated resources. We have inferred around that. And once we get in and develop that, you can see that it's still open to depth and it's open along strike uh, to the west, so to the left side of the screen. So lots of exploration opportunity that remains at Terna and La Luz. Mm -hmm. Just a quick slide on, on the change from the feasibility study to the Asenco PFS that we released last year. A big increased initial capex. Again, bigger project, more ounces produced, more ounces produced over a larger mine life. Uh, we're going to have lower costs from a cost per ton standpoint. Uh, but we did see an increase in, in costs on initial capex. Again, supply constraints, inflation that we've seen come into the industry. Obviously, all the mining companies are making more money and looking at different projects that come online. That's bringing more demand for that equipment. And that's all built into our feasibility study. Again, more detail on this. I encourage all your viewers to go to our website if they want to get more detail on this. We have a full presentation uh, in detail. I go into depth on this. I don't want to kill everybody with all that stuff today. But again, here's our breakdown from an operating cost standpoint. All in sustaining costs over life project, $3.24 under the $20.1575 base case. Under the spot case scenario of $24.1800, you're looking at $1.15. Uh, an ounce of all in sustaining cost and again negative cash cost. Mm -hmm. I have one question in addition um, because I saw in your press release today that uh, you have uh, also, let's say, uh, yeah, higher power creation costs and you want to do that with LNG, so liquefied natural gas. Um, is it because of the topography that you cannot use, let's say, for example, solar? power because i mean you are in mexico right and yep. there's a lot of sunshine so uh, wh wh how did you come on lng i found it really interesting yeah it is actually interesting um first off there is a power line that goes right through the property that we've been using but that power line's lower voltage uh and it gets brownouts so you've got a lot of communities on that power line and cfe the governing body for electricity in mexico they're in charge of that we have looked into bringing a 115 kilowatt line through the property bigger poles takes time we have to negotiate to do that we'd have to negotiate with about 87 different groups uh, to bring up these power poles through guadalajara all the way to the project naturally that does take time and and each member of that group that you have to negotiate with can stall and and take time and it's going to be costly and we've done trade-off studies worked with cfe on that and ultimately came to the lng aspect uh, of liqu liquefied natural gas that's going to be vaporized on site. And it's about one or two trucks that will come up from Guadalajara today to refill what we have on site and we keep storage on site. We are actually using some solar, but it's a smaller portion. So we are using solar power for our camp. Um, a, it's a renewable resource, good for the mining industry. We're all trying to get our GHG emissions down. 
uh, and it's going to be good for the community. And you are seeing growth in solar power in Mexico, but it's still got a little ways to go. And we'll use what we can, like I say, for the camp, for the basics. But when it comes to operating the plant, we need a more reliable source and ultimately um, more reliable source and something that can handle 8.7 megawatts of power that we need for that plant, eight and a half almost. So uh, the LNG is the best from a trade-off standpoint, but it will always continue to look at that and see if there's options as we move forward. Because again, the feasibility study is a 12 year mine life. We think we can be here 15, 20, 25 years when it's all mm -hmm. said and done. Our operating costs compared to our peer group. Uh, I talk about this being a, a flagship mine. And if you look at it on a cash cost basis over the 12 years, 59 cent cash costs puts us in the lowest quartile in, amongst all the our peer group from an all-in sustaining cost again puts us in almost the bottom decile of our entire operating peer group so this mine once it's up and operating is going to be extremely profitable compared to what we see out there today in the silver group world again after tax free cash flow uh just numbers i am an accountant by trade you can know that uh, but ultimately once we're in production base case we'll have about 40 million dollars of free cash flow on spot case today's price is about 52 million dollars of cash flow once we're in production over the life of the project uh you're looking at base case uh about 311 million dollars of after-tax cash flow and 467 million dollars of spot uh price after cash flow so you might be then the future dividend payer we might be a future dividend payer. There's a lot of work left to go. I know we have questions of that. I think we're starting to see a lot of opportunities out there, especially where we think where silver and gold is going to go. But yes, hopefully by sometime when Terranera is up and chugging along and, and printing cash, we can become a dividend payer. Fair question, Jochen. Again, sensitivity analysis. The breakdown is actually, you can see a little bit difference on this slide. 54% of our production is actually uh, silver revenue, 46% gold. Obviously, that changes with as the ratio of gold and silver price changes. But this is a silver dominant mine, no base metals. That's one thing about Endeavor, even with our other operations. Uh, we are silver and we are gold. Right now, we're about 55% silver, 45% gold. Um, so this will continue even when we bring Terranera on, online. Just some sensitivity case uh, on there with different prices of what the value of Terran areas and uh, what the IRRs would be today uh, at those higher prices. Mm -hmm. Technical review. Uh, again, I won't kill your uh, viewers with the technical of it, but ultimately it's an underground ramp access mine. We do have the three portals, one that will access La Luce. There will be a connection between Terran and La Luce. We can reduce driving on the surface. It's not going to be underground haulage. Uh, we're mining long hole for 60%, almost 60% of the deposit. Long hole mining method is very cheap, bulk mining effectively underground that allow us to get it out. There are some areas with ground conditions that aren't as strong that we do have cut and fill. And in Lulus, we'll use a little bit of shrinkage. And there will be some backfill for tear and error. So cemented backfill, paste backfill on long holing, waste rock and cut and fill areas. Um, but ultimately, I think in the PFS, we had about 30 to 40% long holing. In the, in the feasibility study, we did more geotechnical work to be able to support long holing. Uh, and with bringing that long holing in, reduces our mining costs. Mm -hmm. Will you uh, use in the mine itself like an um, electrified sc uh, scoop train, or how do you do that? Yeah, so our PFS had a train. We've taken that train out. Um, we are doing it, we are looking at electrified and diesel still. We think we are going to go with the diesel at this point um, based on costs, but it's something we always look at. We actually even look at the electrified for Bolonitos. We look at it for Guanas to be as well, but just from a cost trade-off study, we are going with standard uh, diesel. Mm -hmm. Our mine schedule, and here's one of the opportunities that we feel like is in the feasibility study. You can see in year one how much development we do. We went from doing 48 kilometers of development in the PFS to 76 meters of development in the feasibility study. A big jump, development's costly. Part of it is from a long holding standpoint. Um, 
But ultimately, where we see an opportunity is as we take ownership of this property, take it away from the third party engineering groups, we have internal expertise of how to do this. This is what we do at Terran or at Guana Civi, and this is what we do at Bolanitos. The, all the development for the entire mine life of 12 years is done in the first five years. We think once we get in here, we can delay some of that development, uh, bring some of that capital X, CapEx, and put it in years six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Uh, ultimately improves the economics of the mine life. Uh, imp that nav can go from the 282 to north of 300, but stuff that we're working on and continue to work on even through the construction stage. Mm -hmm. our, our plant flow sheet, it's pretty standard. Uh, it's grinding, uh, our crushing, grinding, flotation circuit, we're gonna produce a bulk sulfide uh, concentrate. Exact same thing that we do at, at Bolognitos. It's going to go out from Manzanillo, which is a very short truck drive away, and then ultimately sold into Europe, uh, Latin America, or even Canada. Just a quick overview of the mine layout. You can see the Terranera vein on the right uh, using that turquoise dotted section, La Luce, uh, there on the left, and where all the mine's going to sit. But ultimately, we'll have access to Terranera through Portal 3 and Portal 2 and access to La Luz through Portal 1 and actually Portal 2 with an underground haulage. Mm -hmm. And then expiration opportunities, and I've touched on this, the fact that Terranera is open along strike and to depth, and La Luz being open along strike and to depth. And you can see where they sit on, the, on this boundaries map on the right side of the screen. Las Cortes concessions up there on the upper left side in green, we acquired in the last year. We started drilling that. Again, we put out phenomenal results with lots of Cuates, and we're gonna continue drilling Cuates this year. On the southeast side, Cerro Gordo we picked up, we've drilled that, we have identified four to five veins, put out some results from those veins. So again, significant upside with these underground vein districts to be able to go and extend mine life from the 12 years, 15, 20, 25 years. We will be here for a long time. That's good, I'd like to hear that. <laughs> some upside opportunities uh even though the feasibility study is done doesn't mean we're done so even in the construction phase there's always abilities to do trade-offs the world's dynamic things change costs change new new discoveries come out uh new innovations come out from a metallurgy standpoint we think there's opportunity to improve the metallurgy to improve our gold uh recoveries right now we're getting very good silver recoveries we can get better gold recoveries uh, we'll work through all this over the next six to 12 months and see if we can not improve this project from what we've already put out today. Mm -hmm. The timeline, this is often the question, and you touched on this, Jochen, earlier, it is about a two-year build, 21 months, a couple months in there, almost three to six months built in there for contingencies for commissioning. But we expect this project to be online for H1 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll double our production. Uh, we'll have Guanas V, Balanitos, and hopefully Terranera, and maybe even something more as we push through. Because we still have Peral. We're working on Peral pretty diligently because we want to bring that into an economic study, hopefully, for next year. And then I'll, I'll just touch on ESG. I think endeavors for the 15 years that we've been around, we've been great corporate citizens. Uh, we've been pillars in our community. We've helped out communities. We brought a lot of the Canadian and U.S. expertise into certain parts of Mexico from a medical standpoint, education standpoint. And at the end of the day, we think that's an important part. It's a social license to be able to operate in these communities. And sometimes mining has impact. And we are going to be the largest employer at Terranera. We are going to pay north of $200 million of corporate taxes. But we want to be good corporate citizens, operate with integrity, and be be uh, na good neighbors. And ultimately, we've done a great job with our exploration group in Terranera. We have community support. We have all our licenses. We have all our permits to start construction. We have some amendments to do there, uh, but we expect to have those amendments in hand before December 31st. They're small things. We can start construction without those uh, amended permits, but we want those in hand to make sure that we can build this how we want to build it. Mm -hmm. Environmental, again, always looking to improve it. This is a dry stack tailings. Uh, it's what we do up at Guanas V. So we take all the moisture out of it and we stack it. It's a much safer, much more environmentally friendly form to do tailings. More costly, but ultimately that cost is well, well worth it when it comes to what we're doing. So I'll leave your reviewers with this last slide. 
uh, Jochen, mm -hmm. uh, the right formula for value creation. Over the last year, as you know, I've moved from the CFO position to the CEO position. Uh, so we have made changes at the management level. Brad's still around. He's our executive chairman. I was just on the phone with him right before you and I got on the phone. Uh, we brought in Don Gray about September of 2020, who just finished building a mine out in Colombia. Prior to that, he was in Guatemala building a mine. He's been building our team in Terranera. So we're up to about 33 individuals. We'll be about 50 before the year's out. Uh, and we think we have the right people in place to be able to build this project on time and on schedule. Well, that's our goal. Uh, realize our capex is higher than what it was in the PFS, but this is a project that we know we can deliver on, uh, and I think that's very important. Again, we've uh, approved a $13 million budget between now and December 31st to advance the project, so we may remain on track to be ready for H1 2024. Uh, and ultimately, it's going to be a quality project. I've touched on this a number of times, but we're going to be the lowest quartile cost producer with Terranera. There's expiration upside, and we have robust economics here at Terranera. Fantastic. Super. Thank you very much, Dan. That was great. And uh, yeah, I think uh, as we all know, uh, since uh, many years, I've wished, I, I want to say already, Terranera is a great project, and it's a super game changer for your company. Um, one last actual question. So how was the third quarter for you guys so far? I mean, now it's 9th September. The quarter has only three weeks left. Are you, are you happy? I am happy. I mean, we haven't had any particular issues. Operations is going extremely well at Guanasvi and, and well at Bolonitos. And ultimately, we did close down Compass this quarter. And I think we touched on that in our Q2 re news release. And that closure has gone relatively smoothly. We've moved a lot of people that we, some of them we want to take to Terranera, some we can use at Guanas V, and some we can use down at Bolonitos. So that's gone as well as to be expected. Silver prices and gold prices haven't been the same the last two months. But I like to think that's just a, a kind of a lull in the, a longer term story. COVID's obviously still prevalent. Uh, North America and Europe, it's going to be here for a little bit longer. It's unfortunate. I wish we could get through it. Uh, Mexico, it's still there. We're, People are getting vaccinated in Mexico and we're working through that stuff. But ultimately with what the governments are doing and what we're spending, we're going to see higher silver and gold prices. Maybe it's not in the next two months or three months, but it's coming. Uh, we want to be in a position uh, to take advantage of that. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dan. It was a great presentation and uh, good uh, to have you here on board and answering all the questions. Um, yeah. The only thing what I can say, well done. And we look forward then to your project finance and the final kickoff before Christmas, please, so that you guys really can start with the construction and bring this thing then online because we need it. This, we uh, yeah, definitely. Solar e-mobility, we need the silver. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks for your time and much appreciate. It's nice seeing you again. Nice seeing you, Dan. Thank you very much. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that was Dan Dixon, the CEO of Endeavor Silver, and you heard it. Finally, the feasibility study for Terronera is there. The numbers look terrific, uh, even at uh, lower prices, of course, in the base case. But if you use spot prices of today, it looks uh, absolutely more terrific than it does already. But I think this uh, the most important thing is really that this can be Built. This can be constructed. This is not like a $500 million thing. This is $175 million. Absolutely doable for Endeavor Silver. No doubt as the company is uh, yeah, almost uh, debt free because they have like some $5 to $10 million in leases and that's it with a lot of cash. And that's exactly what we like. So there is no risk in the company. They get a project finance for sure at low interest. And then let's go full throttle in 2024. They're going to double their production and half the costs. That's exactly how we want it. Silver and gold is for sure a very good investment and Endeavor Silver also. Thanks for watching us and bye-bye from Switzerland.